dude. Wait, is that? No way. <laughs> Wait, what? No freaking way. Wow. It's about 2226. Where is this on the Morant scale? The 2226. It's low, but it's. It looks kind of unique. It's a uh, third gen because it's got the, ah. the silver right here. You said he was trying to find this for years, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, I, it was, it was hiding in the garbage it, bag. At least, I know I had at least one more around here. Oh, it's clean inside. That's why I was in the bag. Look at that. It's shiny. Wow. It, it all looks clean. mint in there. It's got the original. Wow. Bubble wrap. Was this thing ever used? I don't know. Maybe this is a brand new one. Maybe. <laughs> I know my dad liked them. I don't know. Hey everyone, in today's video, I've got a Marantz model 2226 that's been sitting in a basement for who knows how many years. And in this video, we're going to see if it even turns on. So I just got back from Michigan to visit my buddy Tyler where we started a bunch of heavy equipment that had been sitting for over 10 years. And we stopped by his grandmother's house and we found this in the basement. It was in a garbage bag. So since it spent all that time in a garbage bag, the inside of this thing actually looks to be nearly spotless. I'm really excited to get this open and show you all inside of this thing and see it for the first time myself. Once we do that, we're going to hook it up to the dim bulb, see what we've got at the speaker terminal, see if there's a relay click if applicable, and uh, see if it actually works. So let's go. So the full story on this thing is not exactly known, but I do know that this belonged to Tyler's grandfather. By the way, if you haven't seen Tyler's channel, go check it out. I'll link a video in the description of me helping out starting a uh, diesel 7.3 power stroke pickup truck. It looks like this might have been used in a shop at one point and that somebody with consistently dirty fingers was the one turning it on and off. But other than that, all the switches and knobs, these pots move really smoothly. Nothing is like hard to move or anything. Balance slider is good. All the buttons work. If we look at the case, excellent condition. Look inside of there. Do you see any dust at all? I see like barely any dust. Sides also in great shape. Cat in great shape. Not supposed to be on the desk. And what's really cool about this thing is it's got the original plastic, it looks like, on the uh, AM antenna. That seems quite intentional for somebody to do on their own, so I think that that might be from the factory. We also have the uh, little tie thingy that came from the factory. Not all of those still have it, but some do. On the back of this receiver, what do we have? We have quite a few things here, actually. We've got inputs for aux and photo, tape monitors, main in and pre out. Now that's interesting. Marantz 2225 and like the 2220. Lower models from previous generations didn't have a main and pre-out, so that's kind of cool to see. Then we've got the uh, upgraded speaker terminals for this third generation of Marantz uh, receivers. So, all in all, very nice looking unit. But we need to find out what's going to happen when we put power to this thing. Let's get the cover off so we can see if there's any smoke immediately when we add power. I'm trying to record a video, cat! You gotta leave me alone! Okay, covers unscrewed, just uh, four Phillips, two on each side. It is quite nice in here. You know what? It looks like there was a fan blowing on this thing at a certain point, actually. Maybe that explains why it's so clean. Here, check this out. So I think that something was blowing from this side because look at all of the dust caked on over the output transistors right there. And it continues into the transformer and the filter capacitors. Like, look at all that stuff. But if we look at the other side, perfectly clean. No dust on this side. Like, that's very interesting. So, this was definitely used. It was near a vent or something. Maybe that contributed to the overall cleanliness we're seeing right now. I don't know. But uh, it looks like no one has been here. Well, what's this? Oh, that's a little something that's... Um, what is that? I think that is a sticker that is slowly folded. Yep, there we go. But yeah, this looks very standard uh, Marantz. We've got power amp board, we've got tuner board, power supply. That's probably going to be preamp or something. I don't know what that's going to be. We'll have to take the bottom cover off for that. But 
The components we're worried about lighting on fire really are up here in this area. So it's time to get this thing on the dim bulb and see if anything happens. All right, so it's hooked up. I don't think we should be expecting a relay click because I don't see one. I see fuses on the fuse board actually. So that's probably going to be uh, no relay click for us. Okay, not for this. Not for this one. So I've got this turned on. I've got the lamp turned on. Dim bulb is plugged in. I suppose I'll put on my safety glasses and uh, let's see what happens here. Well, that's a very good sign. There is basically nothing happening and it lit up. You can't see that probably but let's take a look at the front here. How many bulbs do we have working? Alright so we've got one burnt out in the middle one burnt out on the meters so that's uh, that's an easy thing to fix. It's a 100 watt bulb in the dim bulb right there so that's uh, probably why we didn't see anything happen. This is a lower power amplifier. The next thing to do is check for DC offset at the speaker terminals. So let's get that done right now. And the reason we're doing this is we don't want DC at our speakers because DC is not audio. Audio is AC. You want zero volts DC at these speaker terminals and that's controlled by your DC offset or your amp working properly. So we've got ground right here, I turn the speakers on, let's see what we get for the right channel. Um, that's really, really good. I wasn't expecting that. What about the left channel? Okay, there's something more reasonable. Six. It looks like it likes to change a little bit there. Uh, I don't know what that's all about. But well, looks mostly stable. Next thing I'll do is switch it to FM and we'll see if we get any movement out of the meters. Then we'll hook our multimeter back up to the speaker terminals to see if we get any AC voltage out of the volume knob when we uh, change because, you know, FM's making noise. And then I may feel comfortable hooking up my test speakers and seeing what the heck's going on here. Prop this up for you all because there's a stereo indicator that you can't see unless I prop it. So, we're on tape 2 right now, let's go to FM, I've got movement out of that meter, that turns on, if we go through some stations, the FM tuning meter moves around, there's a strong one right there, maybe, okay, looks like the tuning cap is very dirty, it's acting uh, interesting. I just hooked a wire up to the antenna, let's see if it works any differently. Yes, it does. So maybe it just needed an antenna. So we get FM stereo, that's excellent. And uh, we get it multiple places. Okay, let's hook our multimeter up to speaker terminals again. Check for AC. Let's switch to AC. Lime's at zero, let's turn it up. Alright, we got something. That is music right there. Switch back to DC nothing which is just blowing my mind right now. I cannot believe that is zero like I do not understand that okay let's go to the left channel okay we're getting more interesting DC offset here but you know whatever go to AC sorry that AC turn it up we got sound that is insane okay folks Let's hook up some test speakers, see what it sounds like. If you've ever watched my how to check DC offset without any tools video, when I was plugging these speakers in I did not hear anything, like nothing when I was uh, scraping the, the cables or the wires against the speaker terminals. So we're on a station, let's see what happens. Ooh. working but we've got a quite quite dirty volume control here there we go don't be cool 
So it's working. Yeah, very dirty tuning. Ooh. That's interesting. Yeah, I think I'm going to need to clean that tuning back. Hearing some noises I don't normally hear out of an FM tuner like that. That's a, that's a, that's a real interesting one. I don't think I need any more though. Alright, it's time to play everyone's favorite song. There it goes. Yeah, way dirty. Way, way dirty. That's easy though. in ways but also not like these these things are just so good you know they're they're just that reliable not gonna do a full restoration on this one unless we find something really bad uh, it seems to be in you know perfect working order the only thing we have to check right now is the bias really but you know as I put my hand on the heat sink here it is very cool I feel no heat at all so the bias is probably fine. So yeah, let's take this thing apart further, let's get to the controls, get them cleaned, we'll check the bias, and then we'll get the scope out, and we'll check the power output, see if it's still uh, meeting the original spec of 26 watts per channel. One fun little tidbit of useless information. Um, this is actually the very first uh, Gen 3 Marantz I've ever worked on, and uh, one thing I notice about it is uh, if you see this screw, this is just a little sheet metal screw. Uh, it's got pretty thick threads on it, so they cheaped out here. They did what Pioneer did, and all of theirs is they uh, they just drilled holes in here and used a screw that was. Uh, thick enough thread to kind of catch and go through whereas with the Gen 1 and 2's they actually tapped the holes for the bottom cover so that's uh, one little thing I'm noticing in this but you know not a huge deal they came out great I'm sure they'll go in great as well they still feel better than what the Pioneers felt like but yeah we're under here we can see now um, looks like this is this is something new that you'll see in the Gen 3's and like later stereo stuff like they use these very long shafts to get to switches that they mount in the back because it's a little bit easier for packaging like see on the old stuff they would have selector switches with little wires going to all of them and uh, you'd have to solder each individual wire whereas this you can just put it in the PCB solder the pins and you're done so much easier so our preamplifier is going to be this guy right here you see all these things here we're going to have to get some deep sockets and remove these nuts to get to this board not to replace capacitors or restore it, but just to expose the potentiometers so we can get to them to get them nice and clean. And these are not 12 millimeter. They are 11. So everyone, I apologize for all the noise I described in a previous video. In this new house, there is no door separating this basement area from the upstairs. It's just an open stairwell. And this onboard microphone on the Canon 80D DSLR that I use to record videos, it does a really good job picking up everything, which is good and bad. So I'm going to get a uh, lavalier microphone eventually here, but I just need to do some research, pick the right one and uh, figure out how to use it with the camera. Okay. 
Okay, so pre-amplifier board. Everything looks fine. Um, nothing is in trouble, per se. And now we've got excellent access to the bottom of these pots. I don't know if you can see this, but yeah, maybe a little bit. If we look at, uh, let's, let's do the middle pot. There's a little uh, slit in there where we're going to want to take our deoxid sprayer and uh, get the cleaner inside of there. And that's uh, our entry point into the, uh, the wiper on the carbon track. So let's do that right now. And I don't know if anybody's seen the, uh, the ultimate x-ray Tony B video where he's uh, making the funny face for his thumbnail. Um, you do not use D5 on these things. You use F5, this stuff, because I guess D5 doesn't uh, do too well with uh, carbon tracks. So we use the F5 so we don't destroy the carbon tracks. So, so here's this one. Got it. Got it. Okay, so that's good right there. Now, the rest of this is actually quite easy. Let's see if I can show you. So, let's zoom in on the volume pot right now. The volume pot is this guy over here. That one. And we can see that we've got nice, easy openings on the sides there. And there's other ones on the other side here. So. You all heard what was going on. We're gonna go pretty heavy here. I'm gonna go from the other side too, just to make sure we are. Just making sure we get as much in there as we can to get rid of all of that nasty stuff we were hearing. You can see just below the volume knob are the push button switches. So really all you do with those and I think we can use D5 there because that is metal on metal. So I'll get that out. Here's our deoxid D5. Woo! And uh, we'll just hit the switches. Oops. So I'll go like that. I'll come at this one. If you just kind of get it on top, um, it has a way of uh, kind of spreading itself in there. It does pretty okay. There's a bit of an opening on it for uh, like a little uh, the spring lock thingy that actually makes it do the uh, in and out type thing. And we'll do the same thing, and we'll do the same thing on the other side. I don't think you can see it past this, but there are four more switches in here. Same thing with the D5. We'll go right in. Now for the balance slider, what we're going to do is we're going to use a little bit of uh, fader I call this F100, so I don't like to use F5 in here because every time I do, like right now this feels nice and silky smooth, whenever I put F5 in here it gets very, uh, you know, less smooth, so this is basically straight uh, grease per se, I'll get one on that side and then one on this side, and this is going to clean it, this is going to make it work a little better. how you do the balance slider. I would not put F5 in there personally. Even better, you could put some of this stuff in there, uh, fader grease, but this feels pretty okay to me right now. I don't think it needs fader grease, but we will uh, see 
in our testing after we're done with all this. Now for the selector switch. Now this selector switch is kind of nice because you can really see like how it works. I think you can see in uh, the front one there a wiper actually going by. So that's where you're targeting. What I like to do is I like to take the uh, knob that I just took off, put it back on the shaft so it's easier to turn. And I'll just get uh, each of these guys, the F5, from each side. And then just twist it like crazy. Get that stuff in there, clean it out. So that about does it for cleaning the controls on the uh, 2226. And then to put this back, we'll just kind of come back in and uh, just carefully uh, place that back inside here. And then it goes back in much easier than it came out. Take those uh, 30 nuts and washers we had, put them back on, torque them to 100 foot pounds. kidding you should barely torque them at all you know that's tight you know I'm doing barely anything okay so that's push them back now we're just gonna go like that because you know there's like maybe two or three threads on these nuts you could so easily strip this and ruin the shaft and ruin the nut so you don't want that okay other things to look for down here um, I mean, I'm looking at this board, I don't see any um, blown up capacitors or anything. Everything seems fine. Uh, we'll have to test the photo section later. I'm also looking at the bottom of these electrolytics right here, and they look good. You know, sometimes they'll have something blowing through the bottom, and uh, they're in really bad shape, but these look good to me. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. So, up here, the next thing we need to do is... Uh, clean out the tuner cap. And to do that, we're going to use something that uh, a lot of people have gotten really up in arms over with uh, seeing this in a video. It's a WD-40 electrical contact cleaner spray. Folks, this is not WD-40. This is dry contact cleaner. Like, it's it leaves no residue. It's for this very thing. I don't know why everyone's freaking the frig out over me going like this with this spray, you know? So, this is what we're doing to this tuner cap. You heard how terrible this sounded, so. We'll just do this enough times, kind of work it through, and uh, this stuff will evaporate, and it'll take all the nasty stuff inside well, just me spraying it like that. It flushed out all that nasty uh, stuff that was making the tuner cap sound so bad. Well, also, it's also very important we wait for this to dry because what's going to happen is we're not going to get the right stations with that stuff in there wet. That's going to change the capacitance of the tuner cap, so you won't get the right station. We might not get any stations right now because of how much we just sprayed in there, so I'll be able to test this in maybe an hour or two. So that's what I'll do. Probably have dinner and then come back down and see what's going on. So next easy thing we can do is uh, we saw that we had those light bulbs that were burnt out. To change those on the 2226 it's very easy because there's not much going on inside of here. So let's look at the, uh, the tuner stuff right here. We're going to replace those two lamps that were bad on this thing. You know, We had one in the front and we had one on one of these meters. This is very easy with these low model Marantz receivers because there's not all this stuff inside of here. Like, there's actual room for you to work on it. So, like, for example, if we want to change these 200 meters, all we do is we take these two screws right here, we loosen them, we don't even remove them, we just loosen them, so we can slide this little thing back out of here. And right here, there's your two fuse lamps for your meters. I believe it was the FM tuning lamp that was out. Let's see what we've got here. 
This says F8V on it, which to me means that this is an original Marantz fuse lamp. Luckily, I have a bunch of these left over from relamp jobs, so I'm just going to put a used one in there and it's going to look fantastic. Alright, just pulled out a used one. Also says F8V. I'll take this and we'll just put it right back, but I think we might actually leave it out because it's going to make it easier for us to change the other one too. These plastic housings on these uh, bulbs here, this is the absolute worst decision that Moran's ever made in the production of these receivers, is they put these crappy little plastic tabs on this lamp housing to hold down the, uh, the assembly here. And you can see right here, see, can we zoom in on that? And you can see right here, this tab straight up broke right off. So we have nothing to grip onto the housing with anymore because it, it's, it became so brittle, it's just broken, it's gone. So anyways, let's remove the one we know to be bad. And we'll grab another used one and throw it in. Okay, so there's that. We'll put it right back in. All right, and we're gonna barely tighten that screw we loosened because again, Brittle plastic. I know I said we're gonna wait to turn this on, but uh, I'm curious. Let's plug this back into the dim bulb and run it that way and uh, see if anything happens here. Still have very dim, dim bulb. And as you can see, everything's lit up now. Fantastic. And it looks OEM because we used an OEM bulb next to other OEM bulbs. So let's switch it to FM. See if anything happens even. The speaker's not that much help. Yeah, see, I told you there's there's no stations at all right now. Only at the very end, so basically. So it decided to work out. We're not getting any of that crazy stuff we were hearing earlier. It's all just fine now. And volume. Still a little bit of static, I guess. Uh, right channel. This song reminds me of Ozark. It's maybe a little bit of foolery in the right channel right now. Tough to tell if that's from the uh, radio or not. Alright everyone, for better or for worse, I just spent some time uh, jamming out uh, listening to this thing because it just sounds absolutely awesome. Um, but I never even checked the bias before I started doing that, so let's just go right here, right now, and check the amplifier bias. Now, spoiler alert, I've already done it, but I just want to show you. Space, uh, there's an error in the service manual. Basically, what you want to do is you want to measure between the red and green wires right here. So, we'll do this on the one channel. We see that we've got 19 millivolts, and the spec is 20. So, warmed up, we are right on spec. And then over here on the other channel, red and green, 17. So just a little bit under, but you know that's not a bad thing. I'd much rather see that than uh, be over. So I'm probably not even going to touch it, honestly. And then just for consistency's sake, you know we're nice and warmed up now. Let's check the DC offset again, and uh, this will impress you, I'm sure, because this is. Uh, this is just awesome. I, I don't understand how this thing is working so well after sitting for so long. So here we go, right channel. What's going on here? There we go, six millivolts. I think that's just my probe not touching the wire just right. Now we go over to the left channel. 10 millivolts, 11, 12. Again, just remarkably low. Like that's within an acceptable range. I don't think I'm going to touch this thing. I think I'm just going to leave those little tiny pots up here completely alone because this thing is working as it should. The uh, heat sink isn't getting like 
ridiculously hot. I mean, I was driving this thing hard. I mean, I was listening to some Dead Mouse on here at like basically max volume, and uh, you know these these Sony test speakers, they're they're taking it quite well, and so is the receiver. Um, it, it sounded remarkably good. I wasn't expecting it to sound quite that good. Much better than other things I've uh, used here. So, I think what everybody wants to see now is uh, how much power is this thing putting out. So, let's get out the scope. Let's take a look at the waveform when we put a 1 kilohertz sine wave through there. And uh, go from there. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. This is my chair. How am I supposed to do work if I don't have this chair? You should be more like this guy. You should be more like this guy sitting in my work clothes. Yeah, you saw that before. All this was just a uh, washcloth and dish soap. Took all that crud right out of there. I'm gonna do a little bit more touching up on this. We'll clean the knobs the same way, and then we'll be ready for the power test. All right, so we've got kind of a different looking setup here. This is a scope that my colleague gifted me, and uh, what's nice about this one is we can have both channels on the scope. So you see, I've got each uh, channel hooked up to the scope. We can see them in real time. So. We're doing this because we want to see how many watts per channel RMS the receiver is producing when it's fed a uh, 1 kilohertz sine wave. So we also give to be this function generator. I'll just show you. Yeah, that's what we're putting in right now. So we'll turn that off because we don't want to blow our ears out. Right now this multimeter is measuring across the right channel. So I'll show the balance slider. The right channel is going to be our bottom one right there. So. We're going to turn this up and we're going to wait until we see stuff like that. But what we want is the point at which that is being induced. So I'll turn the volume down so I stop seeing that uh, fluttering, I guess. And we see that we have 16.84 volts AC right there. So we plug that into Ohm's Law Calculator. That is 35.45 watts. That's a little more than 26, I gotta say. So now, let's switch the voltmeter over to the other channel and see what's going on over there, the left channel. And I think we're gonna find ourselves a very similar number. So let's bring it up. We're gonna look at the top one right now. Bring it down to where it's not doing the crazy thing. 16.83, so they are, you know, basically the same about 30, 35, 36 watts per channel. So in conclusion, uh, we got this in. It was a little dirty, but not that dirty really at all. Um, turned it on, the controls were dirtier than all heck, and uh, took, look, took a look inside, everything looked pretty okay. So let's put this on FM here, and I'll show you the difference. So you can see, you, know, you may recall, this barely worked before. And down here we were getting all kinds of insane sounds. We, we are not getting that anymore. This is working basically as intended. No more static in the volume knob, which is fantastic. Um, and these all work fine as well. play your favorite song. I just got a text message from upstairs. She wants to hear the song too. She knows what's going on right now. So let's go. Oh, maybe if I do this. There we go.
can't hear it like I can, but I can tell you it's just very clear, very clean, very nice, big full bass. It's just, it's just what you want. So there you have it. Sometimes stuff like this can be exceptionally easy. I mean, the only parts I changed out were two bad lamps that I used used lamps. I mean, look at it. It looks absolutely fantastic. So if you have any questions or criticisms, leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you like stuff like this, because there's plenty more coming. Okay, I will see you in the next one. Just look at it. Dish soap and a dish rag. That's all it took. This thing looks so dang nice. I might try to keep it. Nah, no, just kidding. I have two of my own. Three, actually. Hey, does anybody remember the Power Wash 2230? I'll show you where that is. Here we go for the diehards. The subscribers, the long-time viewers. Here it is. It's been here the whole time. Um, it's exactly where we left it, uh, but we're going to have to get to this one before we get to the 2230 because uh, no one's been asking about this. No one cares if it ever gets finished, so we're going to have to finish this one first. This is for uh, the neighbor who sold me the Jag, and of course you saw me walk past a bunch of other stuff. There's, It's coming, folks. The content is coming. <laughs>